It is the 20th of May, 2011, in Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia. Lawmakers in the country's parliament have made a historic decision to recognize an event of over 140 years ago involving people who were living just north of them at that time as a genocide. The people who they are discussing are the Circassians. Nukzar Siklaudi, the head of the Committee for Relations with Diasporas, had this to say, quote, The majority of Circassians perished, and the rest had no alternative but to flee the country. Just a small part of the population stayed in Russia, and as a result, a number of ethnic groups disappeared from the world arena. Thus, actions undertaken by the Russian Empire could be considered as genocide and ethnic cleansing. Unquote. All over the world, Circassians rejoiced, for this was the first nation to recognize their plight. Demonstrations were held, celebrations were made, indeed, there may have been a sense that the world was no longer ignoring them. These are a people with many different stripes, with groups of them scattered all over the Middle East, Europe, and the Americas. Yet, despite being few and far between, they attempt to hold true to their traditions, culture, and history, for they are a nation without a state, one that has been completely scattered to the corners of the earth by one of the most horrific events of the 19th century. In the early 1860s, the Tsarist Russian Empire killed anywhere from one to one and a half million Circassians who were living within the Northern Caucasus by mass killings forced marches, and intentional starvation. It is estimated that up to 95% of Circassians who were living there at the time disappeared within only a few years. If the Russians aimed at driving them out, they certainly succeeded, as the number of Circassians who live in the area today is comparatively low to then, and those who do remain have had their identities denied and wish for independence crushed. The amount of literature on this topic is scarce, to say the least. When it comes to genocides, Circassia is certainly not the first thing that comes to the minds of many. It is an atrocity which arguably, simply due to bad luck, just hasn't made its mark on the present. Because of the controversy that can surround a topic like this, I believe it is important I disclose my sources before anything else. The main book I have chosen for this topic is Walter Richmond's The Circassian Genocide, written in 2013. Richmond is a specialist in art, history, and culture in the North Caucasus, and has taught at UCLA. Another book which I have used is Circassian History by Kadir Natho, written in 2009. Natho is himself a Circassian, which means one could argue there is an element of bias in his work. However, I will mostly be using this book for information on the Circassians themselves, and not for the main event. There are some other books, articles, websites, and documentaries which I have used, all of which will be in the description and the credits. With that said, let's begin. The Caucasus is a land steeped in myth and legend, being the place of many ancient fables. It is said that Mount Elbrus was the landing place of Noah's Ark, before resting later on Mount Ararat. The god Prometheus is said to have been chained on Mount Kazbek for giving fire to mankind. The legend of Jason and the Golden Fleece took place in the land of Kolkis, which is modern-day Georgia. It is even said that Simurg, the mythical Persian bird, lived in a castle somewhere in these mountains. It would be in the northern Caucasus where the ethnic group whom are now called the Circassians came to settle sometime around 2000 BC, well before human civilization was well established. They are most likely descendants of the Hatians, who came from central Anatolia, although this is speculative, as is with many other things which happened around this era. It is worth mentioning that Circassians do not call themselves by that name. Their real name is Adige, the term Circassian is an anglicized version of the name Cherke, a slur which the Mongols used for the Adige during their invasion of the region, which roughly translates to 
it that stands in the way. Now, I don't want to be accused of botching pronunciation more than what is necessary, so I will continue to use the term Circassian, as it has come to be the most common name for them. The Circassians have been semi-nomadic for all of their history and are collected into many different tribes. These tribes were composed of small owl, a term for a village or community. These often consisted of several extended families, who practically always stuck together. A family unit would consist of mothers, fathers, sons, cousins, grandparents, great-grandparents, distant cousins, and all living under the same roof. The Isles didn't stay in the same place for long, herding animals that travelled with them. Whilst the Circassians had a hierarchy of aristocrats and chieftains, governance was very limited, almost to the point of being anarchic. Because of a lack of authority, the way they kept order was with an extremely rigid code of honour and respect called Habse, which allowed members to take extreme punitive action on other members for minor offences. This permitted things like killing a man's entire family if he did something as light as get in the way of your goat herd. This code of honour was so strict that some have referred to it as Bushido-esque. The Circassian approach to religion was complex. Whilst they are, and still are, nominally Muslim, having been converted by Islamic evangelizers from the south, they only adhere to the faith on a superficial level. The religion which the Circassians drew the most of their customs was referred to as Adigage, which revolved around ancestor worship. It is a religion rich in folklore and mythology, possessing a pantheon of both male and female divine creatures such as gods and spirits. It has been strongly influenced by the Nart epics, a collection of legends of a mythical tribe known as the Nats, and their heroic deeds, which has been shared throughout the Caucasus. Circassian adherence to Islamic teachings was light, something which many Muslims would consider heretical, however this was no issue for them. Whilst these tribes may have possessed similar dialects and customs, they were far from a unified people, as this was well before the era of nationalism. If anything, their tribal unions often fought each other more than outsiders. It was only when all tribes felt an existential threat to their existence that they would unify to fight a common enemy. A well-known example of this is when the legendary Prince Inal brought together the feuding tribes against the Mongol onslaught during the 13th century, becoming the only Circassian to ever acquire the title of Shi, which simply meant the ruler of all Circassians. This era would be short-lived, however, as the different tribes continued to fight one another over petty differences, and at times even be pitted against one another by outsiders, something which the Russians would exploit considerably. Of course, the Russians were far from the only group who were able to have victimised the Circassians. Much of their history throughout the Middle Ages was one of resisting invasion and conquest, not only from the aforementioned Mongols, but also from several other empires, such as the Golden Horde, led by Batu Khan. One particularly brutal episode was the invasion of Timurlane, a warlord from Central Asia with an often overlooked reign of mass murder. The Circassians suffered greatly when the warlord butchered his way through the Caucasus. These traumatic events certainly made Circassians a hard warrior people, but they didn't solve their issue of disunity. By the turn of the 18th century, the Circassian tribal groups were as follows. To the east were the Kabardians. This was the largest tribal group, and still continues to be to this day, with many of the Circassian diaspora claiming descendants from this region. To the west were the Bestanae tribe, who, at some time during the 15th century, broke off from the Kabardians. The same was true from the Hatukes and the Tedmigoys further west, who broke off from the Beslanes. Along the coast of the Black Sea were the Natuhes, who were arguably the wealthiest of the tribes, as they lived on fertile land they could farm on, and conducted considerable trade with other Turkish and European merchants. East of them were the Shapsuks, Abzaks, and Ubiks. Several other smaller tribes could include the Mahosh, Hamish, and Chechenei, 
The diversity between these tribes was considerable. They all had their own linguistic dialects, political structures, economies, and unique histories, which may have included tit-for-tat grievances with other tribes. Because of this, the concept of a unified Circassian nation would never come to be before it was too late. The Russian perspective in all this is far from straightforward. Many have characterized the Russian Empire as a malicious and expansionist, purely driven by territorial ambition, and from a certain perspective, this can be true. However, it misses the greater context of how things came to be this way. Russian history is unusually brutal. From the 13th century onwards, it is a story of crazed, bloodthirsty autocrats gutting their own people, horrific civil wars which obliterate society, and more importantly, resistance against crazed, genocidal invaders who end up killing off a considerable fraction of the population. For much of the 12th to 15th centuries, Russians resisted the attacks of various nomadic groups, the first being the Mongols, who came close to annihilating the Kievan Rus, the state which was the progenitor of Russia and later splinters of the Mongols, such as the Golden Horde. In a way, Russia had a fairly similar history to that of Circassia during this period. The only difference is how it ultimately emerged from the chaos. The Russian imperial state was formed from an endless deluge of violence coming from the steppes of Central Asia, the Middle East, and later on, Central and Eastern Europe. Over time, Russians gained a paranoid sense of the outside world, coming to view all foreign states as potential invaders. To modern Western sensibilities, this may seem like an overly cynical worldview, but in such circumstances, it is one that will be reaffirmed time and time again. The Siberian steppe is an open and wide land, making invasions into foreign land easy, a merciless geography where pacifism and xenophilia will not get you far. This mindset still prevails in Russian psyche to this day, and could explain the motives behind the current invasion of Ukraine, as the Russian state is perceiving the encroachment of Western politics as a potential threat. Against the odds, Russia was able to vanquish its many enemies, from the Golden Horde to the east to the Tatars in the south, and whilst the Circassians merely resisted the onslaught, the Russian state sought to relentlessly expand outwards. Steadily, the growing Tsarist Empire conquered a massive expanse of land in Siberia, annexed large parts of Eastern Europe, and encroached on the Caucasus in the south. This was all a response to deter future invaders, a strategy that has served Russia well, as its sheer size has made it a country that is almost impossible to conquer. Unfortunately, this has all been at the tremendous cost of surrounding nations. There is a prevailing myth amongst Russian academics that their country was never a colonial power, unlike the other nations of Europe. However, an honest look at history shows that this is just not true. All of Siberia is effectively a Russian colony, with a large number of Russian Slavs having settled in the area, displacing the natives. The same is arguably true with Central Asia during both the Tsarist Empire and the Soviet Union. All this is not being said to demonize Russia, but merely to explain their eventual policy towards Circassia. The Empire always had ambitions to annex the Caucasus and potentially move into the Middle East, as that was a source of much trouble that had come its way in the past. This of course meant that the Circassians would be in the way. Now, it would be wrong to say that relations between the Circassians and the Russians were always bad. The Kabardian tribe had been allies with the Russians since 1557, and other tribes benefited from commerce with their northern neighbour. However, once Tsar Peter I set his sights in the Middle East, things gradually changed. As Russians began to settle the area, friction between the two increased. Russian governors and aristocrats in the region believed that the land was rightfully theirs and sought to expand their local influence. Russia was also increasing its military presence in the region due to its rivalry with the Ottoman Empire, both of whom were competitors. In 
Things came to a head when Peter ordered the surprise attack in 1711, which killed tens of thousands of Circassians. The Circassians responded by mobilising their own force of several thousand cavalrymen. However, they were beaten by superior Russian artillery at the Battle of Chala River. This bloody raid would only be the first of many atrocities. The situation became worse after the Russo-Turkish War of 1736-39. Both the Ottoman Empire and the Tsarist one had sought to have the Carpathians as an ally in the fight. The Russians promised full recognition of autonomy and statehood if they fought on their side, and the Carpathians complied. Unfortunately, even after Russia won the war, it went back on its promise years later. From that point, the Circassians had become subjects of the Russian Empire, and in the eyes of many Russian officials, rebellious ones at that. By the late 18th century, Russia had effective control over the entire Northern Caucasus. What was left was the need to consolidate and ensure that all the peoples within the region were loyal to the motherland. Russia had planned to build a string of fortifications, roads, and other infrastructure in the region to aid with its future wars against the Ottomans and the Safavids in Persia. The tribe whose loyalty was considered the most important were the Kabardians, as they were the largest and on top of land which was the most strategically important. However, the Kabardians opposed this effort, and with good reason. The Circassian people relied on migratory animals to live, and needed the landscape to be as it was for their way of life to be as it was. This was greatly disrupted as Russian settlements started to appear on their ancestral homeland, which disrupted life and caused the Kabardian people to languish. Walter Richmond writes, quote, the fact of the matter was that the Kabardians were on the verge of extinction as a result of their former allies' actions. To control the Kabardians more effectively, and prepare for eventual conquest, the Russians built the Mozdok Fortress and supporting Stanitsi in Kabardia at the beginning of 1763. This disrupted and destroyed centuries-old migration routes, which were essential to the survival of all people in the region. Dozens more Stanitsi and fortresses across Kabardia's northern border resulted in more than a loss of territory. It created an existential threat to Northern Caucasus society, whose survival depended on the free migration of their herds. After their petitions were repeatedly rejected, Kabardians had little choice but to fight back, and the war that resulted devastated their society by the beginning of the 19th century." Unquote. The Kabardians appealed and demanded that the Russian authorities cease their activities, but these were ignored. Compounding the situation were the increasing number of Slavic Russian settlers coming to the land to make a permanent life. These newcomers often clashed with the locals in bitter land disputes, and quickly became highly unwelcome. The Kabardians would have to resort to violence to make themselves heard, however this was only prompted by brutal reprisals from the Russian state. The Empire sent expeditions to brutally crush any resistance, which typically involved destroying their entire settlements and plundering anything of value. The Kabardian tribe was soon reduced to living under a Russian colonial regime intent on starving it out. In Western Circassia, things were at the moment better, but in time deteriorated. The Russians had been eyeing the northern Black Sea coast to establish ports and harbours for some time. This too had a strategic origin, as the Black Sea was for much of the 18th and 19th centuries a battleground between Russia and the Ottoman navies. Gaining control of it would give a major advantage in commercial navigation, as well as provide a door to the Mediterranean Sea. But before Russia could do this, it would have to fully establish itself amongst the Western Circassian tribes. Russian traders and merchants had engaged peacefully with the Shapsuks and the Natuhes for hundreds of years, even creating several trade agreements. Unfortunately, these peaceful overtures were occasionally interrupted by outbursts of violence which occurred with increasing frequency in the 1700s. Ukrainian Cossacks were migrating into the area and their population exploded in the 1790s. 
With these new arrivals came disputes and ethnic tensions which continued to gain pressure. The situation gained new dimensions when the Shapsuk tribe had a civil war involving the aristocrats and the lower members. The Shapsuk elite had become friends with the Russian Empire, and when it was learned that they were being overthrown, Russia threw its support towards the aristocrats. But despite this, the rebels won in 1796. The Shapsuks, the most powerful tribe in the West, were now led by a people who were enemies of the Russian Empire throwing an irremovable spanner in the relations. It wasn't long before the Russians gave the Cossacks permission to carry out punitive raids against the Shapsuks. However, they rarely distinguished between pro- and anti-Russian Circassians. Throughout 1802 and 1803, the Cossacks rode in and massacred hundreds of villages and planted a large number of valuable goods. With the seeds of conflict sown, the russo circassian Wars were bound to begin, with the most violent being in Kabardia, one which would arguably be a prelude to a genocide half a century later. It all began in 1804 when an epidemic of typhus struck the northern Caucasus and Kabardians were hit the worst, with tens of thousands of them dying. The Russians sought to contain the spread of the illness by quarantining the Kabardians off from the rest of the world. However, this only ensured that they would be unable to move with their animals, which created a famine on top of the disease. A desperate Kabardian nobleman sought to cross the quarantine line in 1808 with salt. At first, a sympathetic Russian commander let him through, but once this news got to Field Commander Bulgakov, things became ugly. General Bulgakov accused the Kabardians of raiding Cossack settlements and used these false accusations to launch a bloody expedition into their land in 1810. Bulgakov and his forces burned everything in their path, raising entire villages to the ground, committing cruel and wholesale massacres, and taking a large amount of livestock, further exacerbating the famine conditions in the region. Bulgakov was not able to completely destroy Kabardia, however. What he had done was completely unauthorized by the officials in St. Petersburg, the then capital of Russia. Bulgakov also had many rivals in the Caucasus command who believed he was interfering and the general was reprimanded and relieved from his post before he could take his destruction any further. Whilst Kabardia was spared from further damage, they were left devastated. The nightmare for Kabardia wouldn't end there. The Russians soon after appointed Alexei Edmolov as the Caucasus Commander-in-Chief. Edmolov was a hero of the War of 1812, which meant he could get away with all sorts of atrocities committed by Bulgakov without a complaint from superiors. He considered himself to be on a civilizing mission, one to pacify the rebel elements in the region. It was unfortunate then that the man was not above using some rather uncivilized means to achieve these ends, employing levels of brutality that have yet been seen in the Caucasus. Edmolov's first actions was the pacification of Dagestan and Chechnya. The Dagestani Highlanders and the Chechens are two other Muslim groups in the region which Russia has sought to assimilate. Unlike the Circassians, they never came to be eradicated, but have typically been at the receiving end of many Russian atrocities. Edmolov crushed a number of uprisings from them, which were as a result of Russian projects to build forts on their land, rather similarly to the Circassian uprisings. Kabardian trust in the Russian authorities had completely run out by this time. Many leaders were convinced that the Russian Empire was only going to continue to conduct destructive raids on their land and make their conditions unlivable. After 1818, Edmolov became occupied by the events in Chechnya, which is when the Circassians sought to get back at the Russians with violent incursions. This tit-for-tat violence is ultimately what led to the total destruction of Kabardia. In 1821, Edmolov decided that it was time they be eliminated once and for all, and gathered a large army to wipe them off the map. This campaign killed tens of thousands of civilians and came close to utterly obliterating the enemy. On countless occasions, villages were surrounded and systematically butchered with anything of value being taken. 
This wholesale slaughter created a massive stream of refugees fleeing the violence, with large numbers fleeing westward where they would eke out a meager existence. Was the destruction of Kabardia a genocide? Historian Walter Richmond certainly believes so, arguing in his book that according to the UN definition of genocide, Edmolov and his men violated practically every single count. Of course, this may change depending on your definition of genocide, but what happened in the 1820s can be argued to be a prelude for what was to come 40 years later. Western Circassia came to be burdened by the refugees from the east. Vast numbers of Kabardians who had little elsewhere to go were now having to form an extension of another tribe who, to them, was foreign. Some others tried to flee down south into the Ottoman Empire, specifically Turkey. The Western Circassian tribes were in a complicated relation with the Russians at this point. Despite the aforementioned violent clashes, Many of the Circassians in the area believed it in their interests to be loyal to Russia, as they benefited considerably from commercial ties, specifically in the salt and lumber trades. Even after Edmolov, hot on his annihilation of Kabardia, had conducted several raids on them in the 1820s, they still stubbornly held to this position. This loyalty was firmly tested during the Russo-Turkish War of 1828-1829, when, despite being a Muslim people, supported the Christian Empire over the Islamic Caliphate, which could make sense as their natural ally. Russia ended up winning this war, yet despite the Circassian stance, they still received the short end of Russia's decree, as the ensuing Treaty of Adrianople completely stripped away any autonomy they had. Feeling a sense of betrayal, the Circassians decided to turn to a global power who they thought may be able to give them protection they needed, to a little island just off the coast of Europe. The British Empire had always been suspicious of the growth of Russia. Britain's interest revolved mainly around maintaining a balance of power in Europe, one in which no single land army could dominate the rest of the continent. After Napoleon's defeat in 1815, Russia had emerged as one of the big winners of the conflict, and one which Britain started to view as a major threat to the stability. Its greatest concern in this regard was its expansion in the south, as it slowly snatched Ottoman land in war after war, threatening to gain control of the Balkan. Most pressing was Russia's bid to control the Black Sea. British imperial administrators had for long held a paranoid belief that if the Russians could have unchallenged naval presence here, they would be free to enter the Mediterranean and threaten their own naval interests, possibly unravelling the massive empire which it had built over the centuries. The Ottoman Empire was in a stage of inexorable collapse, being simply unable to catch up with its rivals in military prowess. Most believed, rather correctly, that if Russia was allowed to continue in its aggression, much of the Ottoman Empire's northern lands would be absorbed. To Britain, this had to be avoided at all costs. It was at around this time when the plight of the Circassians came to be known in the Isles. Europeans in the middle of the 19th century possessed an exotic and orientalised view of the Circassians. Travelogues often described them as a race of noble savages whose men were fierce warriors, and whose women were naturally beautiful and mysterious. The British public devoured the notion of the Circassians being a poor and defenceless people in need of saving from the malicious Russians once international relations became relevant. Britain sent several envoys to the Northern Caucasus in the 1830s and 1840s to see how much the Circassians could be used as a tool to stall Russia. I would like to emphasise that the British were doing this purely out of geopolitical calculation. It is unlikely that the officials involved with the Circassians ever gave much consideration to the true well-being of the group they were about to utilise. If anything, it is entirely possible that by allying with the Circassians, the British were only encouraging the Russians to enter them once and for all, 
as they strongly wanted to avoid the possibility that foreign nations could instigate uprisings within their own borders. Walter Richmond argues for this possibility, concluding, The truth of the matter was that the British were encouraging the Circassians to escalate their war with Russia by promising them a level of military support they had no intention of providing." Unquote. Precisely how much of an effect the British may have had in these events is a matter of historical debate, but Kader Natho also agrees that the Western Circassian tribes were galvanized into an armed uprising by a short-sighted political move. He writes, quote, Due to the efforts of the English agents, all the coastal Circassians united against the right flank, and decided to jointly resist the Russian establishment on the eastern Black Sea coast, and, as a result, the Circassian raids on the Russian armed forces grew more daring and frequent, unquote. Whether or not the British intervention may have indirectly led to a genocide is impossible to reach a conclusion on, but nonetheless, Russo-Circassian relations continued to worsen. Life for Western Circassians during the 1840s and 50s was gradually becoming a living hell. The Russian Empire was coming to the conclusion that they were not future subjects, but a problematic people who needed to be wiped out. The Caucasus Corps was an army operating in the area and in charge of maintaining stability and order. However, to say that this was an orderly army wouldn't be accurate, as it was treated as a placement for violent criminals and political dissidents. It lacked professionalism and had a reputation for extreme violence and being led by psychopaths. One particularly vicious commander was Grigori Zas, who made it a hobby of his to collect Circassian heads, store them in his quarters, and sell them to phrenologists in Europe. Frequent raids and reprisals were sent into Circassian villages, involving gratuitous violence, rape, and plunder. Compounding this problem was a Russian blockade on all Circassian goods, which was starving them out. A bad harvest in 1839 created a famine which killed thousands of starvation. With such conditions being inflicted on the Circassians by a common enemy, it is strange how they were never able to fully unify to preserve their own existence. It is possible that they simply never took the threat of their eradication seriously. Petty infighting amongst leaders was also a constant issue. Nonetheless, there were serious attempts at creating alliances with other groups in the Caucasus, such as the Chechens, who were currently led by Imam Shamil. Shamil was a devout Muslim and a competent military leader who had an ambition of creating a pan-Islamic state in the Caucasus, one which could attack Russia on multiple fronts. He sent a number of envoys to the Circassian tribes in the 1840s, however, he had demands which the Circassians found unrealistic, such as asking for fighters to be sent directly into Chechnya, or demanding that they abandon many of their ancient pagan practices and become more pious. Relations between the Circassian tribes and the Chechens never became more than an informal and dysfunctional alliance, with the core of the issue being the simple fact that either side had very different end goals. Circassians simply didn't take the word of the Quran seriously enough to get along with Shamil, who by the 1850s was on his own. Even so, unification was unlikely to save Circassia at this point, as all Russia needed now was one more reason to engage in a final solution with the Circassian problem. This event arrived in the form of an all-too-familiar war with the Turks. The Crimean War of 1853-1856 to is a well-known conflict much talked about in Western history books, however its consequences for the Circassians are often ignored. The causes of this war are confusing to say the least, so I believe it is best I give a brief synopsis of the events. The war began when a dispute between Russia and the Ottomans regarding the rights of Orthodox Christians within the Ottoman borders couldn't be resolved. Given that the Russian Empire had long had ambitions of expanding into the Balkans, which were controlled by the Ottomans, it was hardly a surprise that the dispute broke down into all-out war in 1853, after Russia sent troops to occupy part of modern-day Romania. 
The first phase of the war was a naval fight to win control over the Black Sea. The Ottoman navy had an old and shambolic force, whilst the Russians had undergone thorough modernization and were by all accounts technologically superior to that of their rival. The Ottomans were crushed in the decisive Battle of Sinop. Whilst it seemed in that moment that Russia was going to obtain an easy victory, the Ottoman allies of Britain and France decided to step in and lend a hand. The British and the French held that Russia should not be allowed to expand further south, and had promised the Ottomans that they would come to its defence if this reality materialised, thus entering the war in 1854. The Franco-British alliance was able to drive back the Russian navy and take control of the Black Sea. Once there, they landed on the Crimean Peninsula in the tens of thousands in mid-September. Whilst the Russian army was fearsome for the Turks, they were no match for the technological prowess of the British and the French, who were driven out of the peninsula. The Alliance lay siege to the port of Sevastopol, and the Russians mounted several counter-offensives to relieve the siege. Both sides suffered horrific casualties, with disease and cold making fighting a living hell for the troops on the ground. In the end, both sides became exhausted and decided to settle for peace in the Treaty of Paris. The Russians gained no territory or concessions from the Ottomans. The ensuing Treaty of Paris made no mention of the Circassians or their standing. The British seemed to have forgotten about them, and now that they had used a tremendous amount of resources in a war which they didn't want to repeat, there was no chance they were going to send any more support. Whilst a British representative insisted that Circassian land had to be recognised as independent, nothing came of this, which now meant that Circassians were globally recognised as Russian subjects. Subjects which could be dealt with as their masters pleased without repercussion. Furthermore, Russia gained the sensation that its Black Sea coast was insecure. The Empire felt humiliated and in need of doing whatever it took to prevent another defeat. For this reason, Russian Tsar Nicholas I reasoned that the Circassians needed to go. Circassia's fate from this moment had been sealed. By the late 1850s, Russia was in the preparation stage for its final solution to the problem. Tens of thousands of troops that had participated in the war were moved in 1857 to the northern Caucasus, whilst the Black Sea Fleet was kept along the coast. The war against the Chechens led by Shamil had recently concluded, and more forces were drawn from that region to the north. By 1860, the Circassians had been completely surrounded and massively outnumbered by a technologically superior army. It became fairly evident early on that the Russians intended to forcefully relocate the Circassians en masse, the final destination in their minds being the Anatolian Peninsula controlled by the Ottomans. Several Ottoman officials pleaded to the Russians not to undertake this, as they were simply not prepared to absorb that many refugees in such a short time span. This was ignored. The Russians began their operations by cutting down forests and building roads to facilitate their logistics. Initial raids began as early as June of 1860, when a Russian force surrounded and drove out tens of thousands of members of the Bethlehem tribe. At this point, many Circassians were taking matters into their own hands and preparing to leave before they would be forced to. However, many others also decided to stay and fight, believing that the harsh terrain would impede the anticipated Russian assault as it had done so in the past. A final bid for peace was made in September of 1861, when the Russian Tsar, Alexander I himself, was visiting the region. He was visited by a delegation of some 500 Circassians, who, according to one eyewitness, laid down their weapons in front of him and begged for peace on any condition. Exactly how things transpired from here is unclear, but it is safe to say they too were ignored. The final Russian assault began in November of 1861. They were led by General Evdokimov, who wanted to complete the job as soon as possible, since he feared that the longer he took, the higher the risk would become of a British intervention. These fears were unfounded, yet it explains why the man ruthlessly drove his men to work at an inhuman pace, which in the extreme cold ended up proving fatal for many of them. 
Evdokimov also made sure to bring in large numbers of Cossack settlers to take the place of the Circassians after the expulsion was complete. The lives of these settlers was also callously disregarded, as they were unarmed and were sent into Circassian land without protection and supplies, having a very high mortality rate as a result. Since Evdokimov had such a callous disregard for the lives of his own forces, one can only imagine the disregard he had for the lives of his enemy. 1862 possibly saw some of the most savage fighting to have ever been witnessed in the history of warfare. Circassian fighters resorted to hit and run attacks and almost never surrendered, fighting furiously to the last man. The Russian troops engaged in a strategy of total annihilation as a consequence, never taking prisoners and killing practically any Circassian they came across. Village after village was surrounded and destroyed, with all of its inhabitants slaughtered as violently as possible, be that bayoneting, decapitation, or tortured to death. Cannons and artillery were used indiscriminately in areas that were thought to be hiding Circassian refugees, such as in the forests where women and children were hiding. Circassian fighters treated the situation with a level of suicidal desperation that is legendary, with reports of hundreds of lightly armed Circassian men charging straight into bayonets and cannons, only to be brutally cut down. Sometimes, the Circassians performed well during a fight, killing hundreds of Russians. However, these resulted in increased violence from the Russian troops who became angered. Harrowing scenes often followed a terrible battle, with descriptions of landscapes covered in dismembered and bayoneted corpses. Many Circassian non-combatants tried to hide from the Russian troops, but they did not fare well, as they had no food or protection from the extreme cold of the winter. A French agent, Louis Fonville, gives a sobering description of some of the scenes he saw. Quote, we met several Abzak parties who were fleeing the Russians. These poor people were in the most pathetic condition, barely covered in rags, driving their little herds of sheep, their only source of nourishment. Ahead of them, men, women, and children followed each other in silence, leading a new malnourished horses that were carrying all of their household wares, and anything else they managed to take along. Such starvation raged that the unfortunate inhabitants, driven to the extremes, ate tree leaves. This abject poverty gave rise to typhus, which resulted in a horrific number of deaths. The starvation was horrific. Many poor souls died from it, and were unable to lend any support to the mountaineers. We were in extremely straitened conditions ourselves, and frequently suffered deprivations. Without food, without shelter, we frequently stayed in the woods and under cliffs, becoming victims to all sorts of foul weather. Sometimes an owl would take us in, but we would avoid that out of fear of catching diseases that were wiping out entire communities. In one owl, eight people died of typhus in the short time that we were there." Unquote. As such ultra-violence unfolded, Evdokimov gradually made his way through the northern Caucasus, leaving a trail of destruction in his wake. The Circassians, despite their bravery, were gradually whittled down until only non-combatants were left. By mid-1863, all that was left of the Circassian resistance was roaming bands numbering in the dozens. The Russo-Circassian War, as well as the larger Russo-Circassian conflict, was effectively over. As now, that the Circassians had been effectively pacified and defeated, all that was left was the grim task of getting rid of all of them once and for all. The plans for a mass deportation had been formulated by Evdokimov in 1860. The plan was never particularly coherent or detailed, merely being a simple plan to get as many Circassians down south to Turkey as quickly and efficiently as possible. This ploy began as early as the year it was formulated, when the Russians conducted a sort of trial deportation with the Abzaks, forcing hundreds of them out of their homes and shipping them to Turkey. Of course, now that the bulk of Circassian tribes were at their mercy, the real relocation could finally begin. Because of what remained of Circassia were large numbers of starving, desperate, and unarmed civilians 
it was a fairly trivial matter rounding them all up and driving them to the intended destination. The remaining owls were rounded and marched down to the coast of the Black Sea in long columns flanked by troops. Many of these people were already sick and starving, so large numbers of them died along the way, leaving a trail of corpses. Once they reached the coast, they were left on the beach to await collection from Turkish skippers. Conditions along the coast were unimaginably grim. With no food and shelter, the beaches became filled with dead bodies, feces, and huddled masses of the dying. The situation was made all the worse by the fact that they had arrived in a particularly harsh winter, with temperatures going as low as negative 30 degrees Celsius. First-hand accounts describe Circassians trying to keep warm with nothing more than rags, and mothers holding on to their frozen, dead babies. The scene was so horrific that several Russian generals wrote to Evdokimov, asking him to take steps to relieve the situation, relief which never came. Evacuation from the beaches came in the form of Turkish skipper boats that had been sent by the Ottoman Empire to relocate them. The Turkish seamen were not doing this out of the kindness of their hearts, and expected payment for their work. The Russians at first wanted the Circassians to pay for their own evacuation, but because these people had practically nothing, let alone any money, they begrudgingly decided to pay the skippers for loading the Circassians onto their ships. Of course, these funds were not enough, and many were forced to sell their belongings to Russian soldiers in one final act of exploitation. The sheer number of refugees often caused these small boats to become fatally overloaded. The average skipper was only capable of loading around 50 to 60 people at once, but they were often forced to carry as many as 300, becoming crowded and unstable. The Black Sea was unusually stormy that year, and many boats sank, dragging their passengers down with them. A lack of food and shelter caused many more to die of exposure, and the crowded conditions meant disease spread quickly. Needless to say, this might be the single deadliest and most disorganized evacuation in human history. By 1864, only around 4,500 Circassians remained, after no more skippers could be found to transport them. They were resettled by General Olszewski, possibly the only compassionate commander in this atrocity. These remaining Circassians went on to the last remnant of their people in the ancestral homeland. More on them later. With the final and most brutal act complete, a big question remains. Exactly how many people did the Russians kill? Like with many numbers coming from history, it is impossible to arrive at an exact figure. Yet, educated guesses have been made. Using statistical analysis, Walter Richmond estimates that at least 625,000 Circassians died during Evdokimov's operation, which does not include those that died during the deportation or those which were killed in previous wars with Russia. If we do include the deportation, estimates can range from 1 to 1.5 1 million. All of these figures were made with population studies, many of which can be flawed, especially when it comes to Russia dealing with subject peoples. The final death toll of this atrocity is very much a subject of interpretation within a wide margin. With all this said, can what happened to the Circassians be considered genocide? Whilst the Russian intent of mass deportation is beyond question, the intent of mass extermination has not been proven. As a result, the traditional definition of genocide, which some scholars hold to, that being the deliberate and systematic elimination of an entire ethnicity, is debatable. That being said, if one were to use the UN definition of genocide, that being the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic or racial religious group, the case becomes practically incontrovertible. Evdokimov had clearly stated that it was his intention to drive out as many Circassians as possible, and there is no evidence of him providing adequate resources for such a deportation. It was conducted hastily and with little consideration for the lives it was affecting, creating a massive death toll and unimaginable suffering for those that survived. <laughs>
Many Russian apologists have concocted a number of bogus arguments to excuse his actions, such as claiming that it was a peaceful deportation gone awry, or that the emperor offered them fertile and empty land in the south for their inhabitation. However, these have not withstood much scrutiny, and I will cover the industry of denial later. Regardless of what definition of genocide you may hold to, what happened to the Circassians was a tragic and unjustifiable crime. They had been forced out of their homes and driven from land which their ancestors had inhabited for the past 4,000 years in inhumane and wretched conditions, whilst having everything of value taken from them. After so many generations of living in that place, they were now, almost all, practically gone, for no reason other than being in the way of Russian expansion. The bulk of survivors of the deportation arrived in what is now modern-day Turkey, and many of those landed on the shores of the city of Constantinople, now known as Istanbul. The Ottoman government was completely unprepared to feed or house tens of thousands of refugees, so thousands of them started to die of starvation. Many were forced to become street beggars or sell their children into slavery to survive, and grim accounts talk of streets overflowing with scroungers and corpses. The Ottoman Empire decided that this influx of people needed to be resettled. One of the prime destinations which administrators thought of was Inner Anatolia, believing that it was rather empty and that the Circassians would be able to repopulate the area. The other place which they could be moved to were the Balkans, specifically in Serbia, Bulgaria and Kosovo, and around 250,000 Circassians were relocated there. The Ottomans had no competence in the job. They made little effort to stop the spread of disease, causing not only thousands more Circassians to die of typhus, but many of the local populations of the lands they were being resettled to to become infected, creating severe ethnic tensions. They were often put in makeshift open-air refugee camps with little food or water, as much of the supplies were intended for them to have been stolen by corrupt officials. Out of desperation, some Circassians turned to banditry, which caused them to be hated even more by locals, be that Serbs, Bulgarians, or Kurds and Armenians in Anatolia. On top of the problem of relocation, many cultural barriers prevented Circassians from integrating into their new home. The Circassian language and its accompanying dialects were extremely different to Turkish, making communication a challenge. There was also the sudden change in lifestyle they had to endure, going from pastoralists and mountain herders to farmers. The trauma of genocide may have also caused them to embrace violence more so than was acceptable. Walter Richmond writes, quote, The Circassians must have assumed that the Russians' tactics in war, wholesale slaughter of villages, organized banditry, and so on, were accepted European practices in wartime. When crises aroused in their new homes, some Circassians responded according to the Russian model. The European community was aghast at the Circassians, and the Circassians unwittingly earned a reputation for barbarity that followed them wherever they went." Unquote. Despite these difficulties, the process of assimilation came gradually, albeit painfully. The Ottomans intentionally outlawed many of their ways of life in order to speed the process along. In time, some Circassians became officials and soldiers in the Ottoman army, though this was never fully complete. As the years went on, tensions between Circassians and the local inhabitants in the Balkans grew to a boiling point. Nationalist sentiments amongst Bulgarians, Romanians, and Serbs had no vision for Muslims being in their midst, let alone the Circassian newcomers. These tensions snapped during the Russo-Turkish War of 1877, when the Russian Empire tried to gain control of these areas. As if the Circassian refugees had not been through enough, they became the victims of yet another ethnic cleansing that year, with tens of thousands of them being driven out of their Christian neighbours and back into Constantinople 
This was followed by further ethnic cleansings during the Balkan Wars. Today, there are almost no Circassians left in the region. Such mass evictions did not occur in other places where the Circassians had settled, yet conditions there were hardly harmonious. In Anatolia, they regularly clashed with Kurds and Armenians, as both sides formed armed bads which devolved into tit-for-tat violence. More Circassians were settled further south in Syria and Jordan, where the story was similar. The local Arabs viewed them with suspicion, believing that the Sultan was implanting people which were loyal to the Empire in a time of rising Arab nationalism. This too occasionally erupted into violence, particularly with the Druze, which is a religious offshoot of Islam. The Circassian villages were attacked throughout the 1880s. Many Circassians were forced to settle in the Golan Heights, where they carved out an existence for themselves, isolated from the rest of society. This existence was yet again uprooted in 1967, during the Six Day War, when Israel came to occupy the region and expelled its local inhabitants. The most interesting story of Circassian resettlement is that of the creation of Amman, the current capital of Georgian. For several hundred years, Amman had been an uninhabited ruin, but the Ottoman authorities decided to rebuild it by placing the Circassians there. At first, they had to fend off attacks from angry Bedouins, yet they eventually made their peace in the 1890s. The Circassians led the initial developments in the city, and as more people arrived, so did commercial flows. Amman prospered, and the Circassian community there today is an important minority. It is possibly the only positive story to have ever come from this entire affair. Back in the Turkish mainland, the Circassians were at first considered equal subjects based upon Islamic solidarity. The Ottoman Empire at this time was still very much defined by its core identity as an Islamic empire, and coexistence with any Sunni Muslim group, regardless of their ethnicity, was viewed as natural. Things changed with the rise of Turkish nationalism in the late 19th century, when the Turks began to secularise and discard Islamism. Minorities of the empire, including Kurds, Arabs, Greeks, and especially Assyrians and Armenians, suddenly found themselves on the receiving end of a growing regime of discrimination and intolerance. The Young Turk Revolution of 1908 purged thousands of non-Turk officials from the army and the civil service, destroying minority clubs and associations. The Circassians, fearing for the worst, requested they have an independent state somewhere in Anatolia, but this was completely ignored. The creation of a homogenous Turkish state was completed during World War I, and the region saw an unimaginable level of violence committed against these minorities. Millions of Kurds and Arabs died as a result of famine and mass killings to stem their revolts. Around two million Armenians and Assyrians were forcefully deported into conditions so brutal and inhumane that it too is considered a genocide. Hundreds of thousands of Turks from the Balkans were killed or forced out of their homes with the rise of nation-states in that area. Once this nightmare was over, Anatolia was left homogeneously populated by Muslim Turks, and the modern nation of Turkey was born. The Circassians hardly fared well from this outcome. The new leader of the burgeoning Turkish Republic, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, sought to aggressively Turkify them, which included outlawing their language and customs, breaking up their clans with forced resettlement, and executing many of its leaders who would become rabble-rousers in the future. They were even forced to give up their surnames and replace them with Turkish-sounding ones. It was only until the late 1970s when Circassians were gradually allowed to be themselves again. It is unclear exactly how many Circassians remained in the Northern Caucasus, which was now Russia. These were people who had slipped through the mass deportations and killings of the 1860s, or who had been left behind by the skippers. Most estimates drift around 50,000 to 100,000, after dubious censuses were conducted in the 1880s. These remainers, despite being allowed to stay in their ancestral lands, were subjected to horrible treatment. They were continually raided and harassed by Cossacks, and their identity was outlawed and were pressured to assimilate into the Russian Empire, all whilst having exorbitant land taxes imposed on them and their freedom of movement throughout the Empire severely restricted. <laughs>
At times, life became so bad that some Circassians sought to voluntarily emigrate to Turkey. With the ruthlessness demonstrated by Tsarist Russia, there was some hope that the revolution of 1917 could bring some change to this state of affairs, and at first, it seemed like there would be, as the Circassians declared independence from the Russian state and formed the Republic of the Northern Caucasus during the chaos of the Russian Civil War. It only lasted for a few years, becoming conquered by the Red Army in 1920. Initially, the leader of the revolution, Vladimir Lenin, made many promises regarding the national question, promoting the concept that Russia's minorities should have autonomy and a degree of self-rule. Whether or not he was insincere, or if his successors simply disagreed, is debatable, because for the Circassians the Soviets were hardly any better than the Tsars, and were in some ways even worse. The Circassian way of life and religious practices were labelled as counter-revolutionary, and the state set about to crush their identity. Thousands of Imams were arbitrarily arrested, mosques were closed down and demolished, and pilgrimages to Mecca were outlawed. Family life was also perceived as a threat, and the Soviet officials demonised the communal family structure. Bizarrely, they also took to rounding up and deporting elderly people, insinuating that the old were vanguards of zealot traditions, and that they were class enemies. Thousands of elderly Circassians were taken to Siberia to never return. Despite all of this hardship, things just kept on getting worse. Stalinist collectivization in the 1930s led to the complete breakup of the traditional Circassian Arl, as they were once again forcefully taken off their land and put into collective farms. This process was a complete disaster, which resulted in the famine of 1932, killing an estimated 6 million people across the Soviet Union. This too has been labelled genocide by some, as a disproportionate number of Ukrainians died in what has been dubbed the Holodomor. During World War II and the German invasion of 1941, Circassian conscripts were indiscriminately used as cannon fodder by the Red Army, which was too incompetent to prevent the Germans from advancing thousands of kilometres into Soviet land, leaving millions of dead in their wake in ju within just a few months. The Northern Caucasus even came to be temporarily occupied by Nazi Germany in that year. During this brief period, many Circassians decided to throw in their lot with the Nazis, who after decades of Soviet tyranny, understandably saw them as liberators, and there was even a Nazi Circassian division during the height of the Eastern Front. The Soviets were able to reconquer the Caucasus in 1943 after the Battle of Stalingrad. Once this occurred, many of the minorities in the area, such as the Chechens and Ingush, were accused of collaboration with the Germans, which was followed by mass deportations and killings. Yet for reasons that are not fully known, the Circassians were spared. There doesn't seem to have even been a discussion about the Circassians in the Kremlin, which is strange. Why were Circassians not reprised upon like the rest of the minorities, even though there were far more collaborators among them? Walter Richmond speculates that because the Circassians were so scattered across a wide area, that they simply thought it impractical to make a deportation. Whatever the case, the Circassians were for once incredibly lucky. Things gradually got better after the death of Stalin. Soviet policy of assimilation acquiesced, and the reforms under Premier Khrushchev allowed the Circassians a semblance of normalcy which they almost never had. Barring occasional ethnic tensions between them and the Cossacks, life went on peacefully until the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Only numbering around 700,000 at the time of this momentous event, the Circassians were not numerous enough to be given a province of their own, let alone independence. Instead, they live on as a small, unimportant minority in the Russian Federation, one that is out of sight and out of mind for most Russians. In a way, what happened to Circassia is somewhat comparable to the Native American genocide by the United States, a gradual encroachment by an expansionist state which ended in the near-complete eradication of an indigenous population, to the point where they had been fragmented and dispersed throughout the native land. The Circassian Genocide and the Circassian people today are barely ever talked about. In the making of this film, I couldn't find many resources in English other than a few books written by dedicated historians. 
The subject seems to have become forgotten in the West after the Crimean War, as they simply became unimportant. In popular culture, it practically doesn't exist. While several documentaries have been made on the events, I have not been able to find any novels, films, or television shows focusing on this tragic story. The 21st of May of 1864 is chosen as the date of remembrance for the Circassian Genocide, as it is believed in conscious memory that it is when Russia began the mass deportation. Slowly, over the 20th century, Circassians all over the world, be that in Turkey, Jordan, or even Russia itself, demand recognition and justice for the events, demands which typically fall on deaf ears. If anything, there exists a considerable industry of denial and downplaying by the Russian academia, with many notable Russian historians writing books and publishing articles saying that the Circassians willfully left and that they were always part of the Russian motherland. Such pseudo-historical narratives are persuasive amongst Russian nationalists and imperialists, especially now with the current war in Ukraine. Today, Georgia is the only country to have given full recognition to the events of being a genocide. Why it did this is not entirely straightforward, but it is most likely because of its current grievances with Russia occupying its land and to please its Circassian minority. Politics and convenience certainly play a major hand in what gets called and not called a genocide. Ukraine, for instance, could benefit from acknowledging its events, yet it sits on land which itself could be considered to be a part of historical Circassia, and if it does indeed acknowledge the truth, it could open possibilities of Circassian irredentist claims. Another curious example is modern-day Turkey, which, despite having a population of several million Circassians within its borders, refuses to officially recognize it, since it believes in having good relations with Russia. Numerous Turkish politicians have made statements and remarks regarding it, yet not much has come of these. There is also the fact that Turkey is itself a genocide denier, and if it were to make a statement, spectres of the past, which it has sought to suppress for over a hundred years, may come to haunt it more than ever. But what happened to the Armenians? Here's a story for another day.